We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good. I think then we are going to um, get going and uh, make a start on this um, session. And um, I would like to thank uh, my fellow panellists and um, our audience uh, for being with us um, here today to discuss uh, the challenge of delivering children's rights in a digital world. So we have um, an hour for uh, some um, uh, really interesting questions and um, discussion. And I'm just going to very briefly set the scene uh, and introduce the speakers um, and invite everyone else to be thinking up their questions and be ready to um, participate in this session, which is really meant to be um, interactive. Uh, so, uh, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child um, earlier this year adopted General Comment Number 25 on children's rights in relation to the digital environment. Um, as uh, you may or may not know, the Convention on the Rights of the Child is the most ratified uh, treaty uh, around the world, but for much of its 30 years, it's not said so much on the question of the digital environment. And um, what has been said in the child world, rights world has been more often um, focused on protection than on recognising uh, the relevance of the full range of children's rights. Once the general comment was um, adopted, uh, it really does make it kind of official, if you like, that the uh, all the articles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child apply in a digital world. It's an authoritative document and it sets out in some detail the responsibilities of states and business in ensuring a digital world that respects, protects and fulfills all the rights of all children um, online and indeed offline where they are impacted by um, the advent of digital technologies. So we have here as speakers today um, one member of the Committee on the Rights of the Child, um, Philip Jaffe, and uh, several members of the Drafting Committee, um, as, I will, as I will introduce. And we really um, are keen to have a discussion about what next. How do we take forward the work of the um, Committee on the Rights of the Child, and how do we kind of bring that thoroughly into discussion with the Internet Governance Forum and those concerned really with Internet governance globally? So we want to think about um, impact, outcomes, responsibilities, and, and um, the uh, actions of many uh, stakeholders. I'm aware that we have, after this session, another session that's really going to focus on the general comment in relation to legislation. So I thought we would keep this conversation open and think about the responsibilities of all the different kinds of stakeholders, public, private, and third sector, and how they uh, come together. So, um, if anyone has questions about the text itself, about its guiding principles, about the practical challenges, um, this, is, this is the moment to um, think about them. So let me introduce uh, speakers. Um, we're going to first hear from uh, Philippe Jaffe, who is a full professor at the University of Geneva in Switzerland, um, founding, former, founding uh, former director of its Centre of Children's Rights Studies, and in 2018, he was elected to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. He's originally a clinical and forensic psychologist, um, and for many years, his academic and professional activities have focused on children's rights uh, and child protection. After um, Philip, we'll hear from um, Biban Kidron. So Baroness Kidron is a member of the UK House of Lords and founder and chair of the Five Rights Foundation. She is a thought leader. Um, wherever children interact with the digital world, including innovating in relation to data protection, age assurance and artificial intelligence. She's a member of the UNESCO Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development and the Global Council on Extended Intelligence. I don't know if there are other kinds of global councils. Um, 
Jerison Lansdowne will speak next. Um, she has published and lectured widely on the subject of children's rights internationally. She was founder director of the Children's Rights Alliance for England and has worked as a consultant for UNICEF and indeed many other organisations, including preparing several general comments for the Committee on the Rights of the Child on Article 12, the right to be heard on adolescence, I've probably forgotten something, I think perhaps on play, um, and now on um, the digital uh, environment. Uh, and um, I realise I forgot to introduce myself. Um, I'm Sonny Livingstone from the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of um, Economics and Political Science. I worked with all these fabulous folk um, in, in preparing the general comment and responding to many of the consultation responses that came in both from stakeholders around the world and um, in relation to uh, children. And I currently work um, with UNICEF on Global Kids Online and with the Five Rights Foundation on on the Digital Futures Commission. And I believe somewhere, oh yes, on this um, uh, Zoom screen, but not, not showing his face is Daryl Williams, who's a policy officer at Five Rights. Um, Daryl has a background, hello Daryl, in um, qualitative and quantitative research, specializing in children and young people. And he has very kindly um, uh, volunteered or been volunteered to um, write the report on this session so that we have a, a document of everything that has been uh, said. So I've go, I, I, in turn, we're going to hear from uh, Philip Biban Jerison, um, and um, I shall add some comments for um, about eight minutes each, and then we're going to have time for questions. And so I'm going to kick off by turning the floor over to um, Professor Philip Jaffe, and I am going to try and do the um, screen sharing business on his behalf. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sonia, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Let me let me quickly just uh, underscore how proud proud I am to be sharing uh, this virtual stage with uh, all three of the ladies here, um, and, and and just acknowledge how um, much of a contribution Five Rights and you as experts have um, made for the general comment that we'll be talking about this afternoon. So I will provide a very general overview of the significance the process and the content of the general comment. Uh, but first to be clear, uh, the rights of children in the digital environment have been on the radar of a lot of people uh, for a very long time and, and for the Committee on the Rights of the Child um, as well, um, at least since uh, 2012, more or less, and especially since 2014, when we held a general day of discussion on the topic at the UN in Geneva. And as uh, years ticked by, uh, it became uh, very urgent, um, you can go to the next slide, that the committee proposed uh, guidance on this important topic, given that as far as children's rights are concerned, um, the digital environment was, and perhaps you'll probably agree, it still is the wild <clears throat> far west in need of regulation. The general comment is not a small deal. It's a document that provides robust guidance to 196 governments. And many of you are familiar with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and that it is a, a binding document. But uh, since 1989, not a comma has changed. So every general comment is proof um, that the convention is alive and kicking. It's, uh, it signals how the committee asks uh, governments, civil society, and all stakeholders to uh, interpret a specific right. With General Comment 25, the committee entered a whole new universe, the digital world, and uh, made strong recommendations uh, regarding the need to take children into account and to try to establish rules uh, for their healthy presence and um, to protect them uh, where we uh, could. At the center um, is this challenge that children's digital rights must cover uh, children's evolving capacities in a digital universe that is changing at lightning speed, along with te technological advances that move much faster than uh, governmental regulations. So on process, I would just like to underscore um, that uh, many, many children were um, consulted in very well-designed regional consultations. And uh, just to demonstrate that participation of children is not a buzzword. And obviously, there were many consultations, and uh, Sonia referred to this, um, with um, 
uh, civil society stakeholders, and obviously uh, yes, governments, uh, so-called states, parties. Let me move on to content, um, and you can go to the next slide. If you have not read the general comment, it's a 20 dense uh, pages long uh, document. It contains 125 paragraph, paragraphs. And it's a comprehensive document that covers many areas and many more than we'll cover, even if all of us uh, took uh, a share of them uh, this afternoon. Um, today, I'll just highlight uh, three uh, areas, basically. Um, but you can go to the next slide. Best interests, access, and protection, and evol evolving capacities. I often say, and this is no surprise to my colleagues here, um, that uh, my favorite um, paragraphs are, are uh, paragraphs 12 and 13. And um, if you go to the next slide, I'll just read them out really quickly on best interests. States parties shall, should ensure that in all actions regarding the provision, regulation, design, management, and use of the digital environment, the best interests of every child is a primary consideration. This is really important to underscore. And I'm not just going to read the whole uh, paragraph uh, 13, uh, just uh, if you could uh, pay attention to what is in bold and uh, the references again uh, to um, the best interest uh, principle, which is really, really core in the thinking of the committee. Um, access and protection, the next slide. Uh, there's a lot to say um, um, on this count, but perhaps a starting point is is just to stress that the general comment does not fall into the trap of uh, the dominant popular narrative that the digital world is filled with dangers uh, and that the paramount concern of every ad adult in government should be to provide children with as much protection as possible. What the committee and its ex external experts try to do, I think, is rather successfully indeed, is strike a um, careful balance between protection and access. And the, the digital world must, for children must be open for exploration, uh, learning, and leisure, and not only for children, but all children. So access, no discrimination, but many other rights that go, are, are, go along with that. Respect for the freedom of thought and freedom of assembly, uh, children's privacy. Uh, of course, protection needs to be ensured, and of course, especially for younger children. Uh, so risky and life endangering um, uh, negative uh, practices must be uh, at the very least monitored and to the greatest extent possible eradicated in the digital environment. Let me end with uh, evolving capacities, um, which refers to Article 5 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which calls on everyone to respect the uh, maturation process of children who uh, from a total uh, dependency uh, during infancy grow and mature toward um, total adult autonomy. And obviously this is particularly significant in the digital environment because uh, children are immersed uh, much more than adults in this environment. And almost from the start, they uh, de demonstrate higher proficiency levels than their grown up uh, care caregivers. And I can testify to that. My nine-year-old son uh, refers to me as a Neanderthal in terms of digital skills. Um, but careful, you know, evolving capacities is a complex notion that's intertwined with uh, psychological, social, and uh, neurocerebral development. There are moments during developmental phases um, during when we know, in fact, science knows that the safe and sound evolving capacities of children depend very heavily on having in-person physical and even skin contact with other uh, human beings. And in this sense, I, I just want to maybe paradoxically under, underline that young children should be protected from screens um, to a large extent when, they take, when, when screens take them away from crucial phases of social development. And at the same time, it must be recognized again in this general argument on, on evolving capacities that uh, for adolescents, uh, their digital presence sometimes counts much more than their physical interactions. And this 
to some extent needs to be uh, respected by uh, adults. Now, I, I, I know time is short, so let me end with um, perhaps a little bit of uh, cosmic poetry. Um, the, the pace of innovation in the digital world is just amazing, but it's uh, also well matched by this maturation process uh, in children, especially uh, during neurocerebral spurts in early childhood, but, but also later on when children outgrow their pants at record speed. And, and, the same, and at the same time, the technology with, with which they cohabitate is ever more ubiqu ubiquitous and more interactive. And, and so let me assert that in, in many ways, the, the digital environment, environment is at its core a children's environment, even though it was only conceived for adults um, by adults. But I, I want to make this argument. It should be seen more as a child's environment. And going forward, uh, this should uh, command um, all our attention, everyone's attention uh, to uh, this very important area of children's rights. And with that, um, Sonia, let me hand back the uh, floor to you. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, um, Philippe. You've left me um, contemplating my mortality now as um, our generation <laughs> um, gives way to uh, today's children who will indeed inherit the internet and the wider digital world, whatever, whatever that may bring. So um, yes, it's really crucial that we, we get this right. Um, let me thank you so much. Let me turn to um, Baroness Kidron, who is going to, as it were, pull out, I think, some of the principles for regulation and how that's already been taken up by some uh, influential bodies around the world. So over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sonia, and thank you, Philippe. It's always lovely to go after you because I feel persuaded of the very uh, great fundamental importance of, of, of the work of the general comment and indeed uh, the convention more broadly. Um, so as Sonia said, I was asked to talk a little bit about principles for regulation and then also some of uh, what we've seen in the last year. And I think that, that in, um, in, in setting out, I, I decided to set up five thoughts or five things that just keep on coming up in, in a regulatory uh, arena. Um, and they, in a way they, they echo, but I hope don't repeat what Philip said, because it is extraordinary to me how very often I find myself having the same argument. And, and I think it speaks to the value of, of the work of the convention and of the general comment. When I say that the first principle is that a child is a child until they mature, not until the moment they pick up a smartphone. And as ludicrous as that sounds, uh, we have to realize that the operating, that the vast uh, uh, area of regulation of any kind in the world for children is 13. Yeah, the age of adulthood, the de facto age of adulthood is 13. And this is an enormous, um, this is an enormous uh, stone to move. Now in the UK, we managed to move it uh, in data protection law in the age appropriate design code. But even now, as we argue about, you know, uh, the, the Digital Services Act in, a, in, um, in Europe, and indeed in some work that we're doing uh, further afield, what we keep on coming across is concepts of minor or concepts of, uh, of, of going with uh, what technology companies uh, terms state. And so I think that the first thing that the general comment does and, and asserting children's rights is say, hang on a minute, all children um, deserve uh, uh, privileges, protections, rights, you, you know, they, they deserve what is inherent in, 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 uh, and given to them uh, by way of the convention. And as Philip has already pointed out, and, and I'm sure Jerison will extrapolate on, you know, that is in relation to their evolving capacity. We're not saying that, that a five-year-old needs the same set of uh, considerations as a 17-year-old, but a 17-year-old still needs consideration. And in and, and, and the application of their rights. So uh, I have to say as a, as a lawmaker, as someone involved very, very deeply in regulation, um, I have that argument very, very frequently. And so the assertion of what a child is, is the first and most primary uh, principle that we have to uphold. Um, 
And, and I suppose just as a sort of addendum to that is that actually also uh, children's rights should be operating on services, not just those that are directed at them for commercial reasons, but where they actually are, wherever they are. It goes with the child. It doesn't sit with the fantasy of the adult world about where that child is. I think the other thing is, um, you know, is, is obviously fundamental to, to the convention and, and therefore to the general comment, which is uh, regulation can't cherry pick. Again and again, I see, uh, I see the assertion that the freedom of expression is greater than the, the, the right to privacy or that the right to privacy is the primary object. And, and indeed, uh, I'm, I'm sure that, that this will come up again is, you know, the participation rights, the, the right to uninflected information, the right to protection from harmful material. You know, all of these things are in balance and all of these things have to be considered. And, and I I have to say that the regulatory world finds it very, very difficult to remember all of a child's rights and in particular their participation right. And, and we've seen just recently um, a proposal in Australia, for example, uh, that the, the way we deal with online safety or, or, or data protection is to require parental consent up to the age of 16. Well, that's not sufficient. Uh, and that's not rights respecting. So I think that 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 that, that fact that you can't uh, cherry pick is is part of the complexity and part of the beauty of of children's rights. Um, third is is really uh, uh, the idea of. Um, tackling risk rather than harm. I think we've been through a, a decade of arguing about what are the harms of the digital world, and, and some of them are really obvious, you know, and, and, and easy to see um, in terms of, you know, outcomes, uh, you know, of over, over access to pornography or, or being grooming or CS, CSEA or, um, you know, or sort of addictive techniques and so on and so forth. There are lots of different uh, lots of different harms, but actually one of the principles of regulation is that it should seek to go upstream. Safety by design is generally what we call it. Child-centered design is my preferred term. But, but, the, but the bottom line is regulation should seek to take, uh, to take a level of risk out. And I, and I really want to be clear about this. Uh, the digital world, just like every other part of the world, will not be 100% risk-free. And, and nor should it be because some of those balancing rights means that children have to um, have to um, transgress and and tour the world in ways that they that, that that may that, that that may they may trip up on let's put it that way um, but that doesn't mean that these aren't consumer facing products and services and actually a car with no brakes is not fit for purpose a supermarket with something poisonous on every other shelf has to close you know that that we have to see um the general comment in practice as a way of sort of putting um putting product safety into the equation which is something that has been missing and i think it does a really good job of explaining that and explaining the balancing factors in that. Um, I think the, the fourth thing is that is, is very clear and, and hugely important to me personally is we should not ask children to hold the responsibility for badly designed systems. So if you deliberately design endless scroll or autoplay or trending lists or disappearing content or you know you put live streaming and have it on public to so a child is is suddenly uh, talking to five million people around the world who can then direct message them you know these are fundamental uh, uh, design problems in the system and so often I hear that actually what we have to make is children resilient or 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 literate. Now, I would always argue for data literacy and for digital literacy and indeed for critical literacy. But it, it, it is not the responsibility of the child to sort of uphold a poorly designed system that has not been designed with them in mind and, and take the responsibility for that. So I think that's an, an, another thing that is, is a sort of a perennial amongst uh, um, amongst regulators and lawmakers, they go, you know, they put children in the too difficult box and say, I know what will educate them a bit more. Well, actually, it's an asymmetric battle as we have it here. And then, and then finally, I just 
really want to make the point um, because you know so often I find myself talking in a in a global north context but actually you know that the, the, there is another battle here which is digital equity you know the, 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 what we hear again and again from children all over the world is that they want access but they want it on a particular basis and and I think that safety must not be considered a separate component to digital equity and empowerment, you know, because without dealing with the ubiquitous uh, risk and uh, and discrimination and difficulties of of the online world, we actually not allowing certain people to feel safe and able. And indeed, you know, in certain places, we see girls being pushed off because parents don't think it's safe, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think that child online safety is an essential part of equity and empowerment, but it, 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 it must include the opportunity to have a stake in building and innovating our collective future. So those are the principles and, and as basic as they seem, I have to say, I have just rushed to this meeting uh, from parliament and I had to make these arguments even today uh, on behalf of children. So it is, it is a perennial, and I think we do have to start with that. And the general comment is really an articulation of these things. And, and, and I'm also, like Philip, very proud of it. Um, I just want to really briefly uh, mention a few things that have happened in the year. So we've had a number of... Um, you know, major organizations, the, the World, Health, World Health Organization, the Broadband Commission, uh, the Global uh, uh, Partnership Against Violence uh, uh, Against Children, um, UNESCO, UNICEF, ITU, et cetera, et cetera, all get, uh, all push uh, forward and say, this general comment, this is absolutely marvelous work. It, it must be, it is an imperative for all of us to implement it uh, and we, we stand behind it. Um, many, many organizations at a very, very high level for which we are very grateful. But unless and until it finds its way into international agreements and, and uh, um, uh, national legislation and regulation and is unpicked by the various people who have the duties to, um, to, to, to amplify its, its requirements, uh, it will not have the strength that those of us who worked on it and all the people, and again, I want to back up what Philip said, the hundreds of people from all over the world and the thousand children who put into the general comment, we have to see it in. And I have, and I am really pleased with where we are, but I think we still have a, a long way to go. So the EU has uh, cited the general comment in their child rights strategy. Uh, that's a very important place because every time there's a new piece of regulation it helps make the argument for it being then included in further eu regulation so for example we have seen and and five rights played a big part in this that uh, it is cited in the eu ai act at recital 28 and that is hugely important when you're making judgments about automated systems that children's rights must apply. Uh, we saw it in the OECD recommendation on the children in the digital environment in the data privacy regulations. And again, when you look at the notes that go together with those recommendations, you start to see how the general comment has articulated children's participation rights as well as their data protection rights. And again, that balancing act has been hugely important. Um, uh, it is uh, going to be a recommendation uh, of, of, be, of inclusion for the online safety bill here in the UK, uh, which is a really landmark piece of uh, legislation that we're expecting uh, to go through Parliament next year. Currently, it's in there. And it is also on an amendment uh, to the Digital Services Act in the EU. And again, the absolute, um, you know, the, the sort of framework nature of it uh, in legislation means that when people start to ask the difficult questions, they are actually being directed and signposted in ways that are really highly thought through and very respectful of children's views 
and very respectful of the balancing of their rights. Because I think my fear is that without taking the general comment in its entirety, that we're going to see some very, very um, uh, uh, br sort of blunt regulation that may have the effect of keeping children out of the digital world instead of designing the digital world for their presence. And I think that, that maybe I will stop there because I, I know that, that there are other speakers, but I, I just really, uh, I really feel passionately that this is the first overarching framework that really says how children's rights apply in the digital world. And I think the more that it can be copied and spread and cited, uh, the greater its impact will finally be. Thank you. Thank you, Biban. And um, uh, I think it is um, absolutely inspiring to see how, how the um, general comment is being taken up. There is so much work um, more to do. Um, and we very much hope those at the IGF are, are, are going to kind of take this message. Um, uh, as you said, one of the one of the key messages that we wanted to kind of put into the drafting of the general comment was, well, there are many things uh, to be done, we don't want to responsibilize the child, we want to kind of call on all of those in the society who are who are responsible and people often talk about states and business. Um, I, we also uh, very much want to kind of appeal to those who are already child rights advocates um, NGOs working in the third sector, who have sometimes felt technology is a bit difficult or or too complex or so so the general comment is also written to 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 reach out to them and uh, I want to call on um, Jerison Ansdown to say some words about how um, those organizations and um, civil society um, child rights defenders might kind of work with the general comment and really what you've seen Jerison of of how other general comments do become a kind of rallying cry for for action and improvement so over to you thank you um, and you're muted, but um, you can. Um... Sorry. Um, so Philippe talked about the sort of substance um, of, of the general comment and Bibel talked about the principles. So I want to talk a bit more about process. And I think um, one of the uh, great successes of the Convention on the Rights of the Child has been its capacity to inspire national networks of NGOs um, building coalitions to work collaboratively to monitor and advocate for implementation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And over the 30 years of the Convention, there's been a lot of lesson learning about how to do that effectively, what works, why it works, because it's never enough. As, as Bubin has said, it's never enough just to have the general comment itself, its recommendations uh, and its guidance. It's an important, hugely important first step but we now need to proactively advocate for those recommendations to be translated into concrete action, um, certainly at the national level as well as the international level. And NGOs have a really important role to play in making that happen. They can, they can play an important role in challenging and changing opinions, uh, in promoting um, and reaching out to politicians to get political commitment uh, for implementation. Uh, they can help translate the recommendations into concrete proposals for the national level. Uh, they can make the issues much more visible. Um, very importantly, they can work collaboratively with children to enable children's voices to be brought to the table directly with politicians who are enacting legislation and policies. And in so doing, what that does is strengthen government accountability on the Oh, Jerison has um, frozen, I believe. It's never quite clear whether it's Oh, maybe she will um, reappear in the months that they've made. So, can you hear me? Um, you, you, you disappeared briefly, but you're back. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Don't know what that was. Um, so there are there are um, seven steps I wanted to point up to in relation to um, an effective advocacy strategy. So um, the first thing is is as as. Sonia and Philippe and Biban have suggested the, the rights are indivisible, um, that you can't protect one right without thinking about other rights. 
Um, so, so you need to think in this, but the, but the, but the text of the, of the general comment is very broad. It touches on a huge number of children's rights. So one of the things you need to think about in, in undertaking your advocacy is where is the entry point? Where do you want to enter into your advocacy strategy? Do you want to focus specifically to start with on privacy, on data collection, on um, education and digital rights in schools and access? Um, and some of the ways you might think about where those priorities are, are what's the severity of the problem in your country? What do children think? What's most important for children at this point in time? What are public attitudes and where are the windows of opportunity? For example, is there a piece of legislation going through parliament that you could you could draft amendments, get amendments tabled to add to this. Are there particular issues coming up within the society or an election coming up where you can actually get politicians to really think about this strategically and, and gain their support? Um, the second step is to think about where's the evidence base. So obviously um, you need evidence that there's a problem that needs changing. Now clearly you've got the, the text of the, of the Conventional Rights of the Child itself and you've got the, um, the strong recommendations and guidance contained in the general comment. And so those provide you a very starting point good starting point of the evidence of what's needed. Uh, but you also need children's perspectives as part of the evidence you need. Maybe you need quantitative and qualitative evidence of the scale of an issue and concern. Um, you might want to look at um, where the gaps are in the existing legislation and its inadequacies and its failure to comply with the standards set out in the general comment. You might want evidence on the scale of the problem as it is expressed in a particular country. Um, or maybe you want to undertake um, a, a, an investment investment in, in commissioning um, research or surveys in order to get further evidence of a problem in order to strengthen your case for implementation. And then the third step is to form is really to frame the goals carefully. Governments never respond very effectively to just criticism. They're not doing enough or they're not doing things properly. You need to think about very concretely what is it you want to achieve, why you want to achieve it and how can you achieve it. And then a really important fourth step is the, the role of stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders? And it's really valuable in, uh, for NGOs to think really imaginatively about who can they bring on as allies to strengthen their case, because different stakeholders will bring in different skills, they'll do, bring in different points of access and networks, um, additional resources, additional expertise, and, and, and raise the, the, the volume of the voice, putting pressure on government to achieve change. So different stakeholders, obviously children, I can't reiterate there enough, they are a key partner in all of this, but parents' organizations, policymakers, academics, the media, maybe even trade unions, professional bodies working with children, unions, professional bodies of teachers, of, of health professionals, of lawyers, and so on and so forth. Then the fifth step is how to get your messages heard and who do you want to influence? So you need to formulate the message really carefully and think about um, uh, where are the resistances and how are you going to address those resistances? So in the context of the digital environment, we know there are huge tensions, for example, between um, uh, lobbies who are pressing for much greater commitment to privacy and freedom of expression, um, and that some of those will challenge any efforts to strengthen the protective environment of children. So think about who are the who are the people who are going to be arguing against you? How do you frame your arguments with them? How do you engage with them in order to strengthen your position? And then the sixth step is thinking about, well, how are we going to, how, how are we going to take action to move this forward? Is it is it is the is main problem to raise awareness? to lobby and negotiate with politicians, uh, build support, organize conferences, social mobilization, strategic litigation in countries where the Convention on the Rights of the Child is incorporated into domestic law. You can think about taking a case where the government is failing to act or, or is actually violating children's rights in relation to the digital environment to take uh, to undertake strategic litigation. And there is an interesting development, I don't know if, if um, Philippe would agree with me here, but um, at the international level, the Convention on the Rights of the Child has an optional protocol on a communications procedure. And recently there were um, 16 children uh, from 12 countries around the world who presented a climate related petition to the Committee on the Rights of the Child, um, wanting um, to 
arguing that the, that their, the five states uh, had failed to act to protect them from violations of their rights in the context of the climate emergency. They constituted this was a violation. Um, and so the committee considered this, and whilst they rejected the petition for, for, for a, I won't go into it, but for technical reasons, they did recognize that it was admissible for the children to bring a case uh, concerning harm which was outside their own territory. Um, and can therefore be held, the state can therefore be held responsible for negative impacts of, in this case, carbon emissions um, on the rights of children inside and outside its territory. So I think it's interesting because there are some comparables, it seems to me, in the digital environment, because the digital environment operates both inside and outside children, the territory in which the child is living. So it seems to me, and I don't know whether you'd agree, but that, that there's a principle established there uh, which could be reflected and, and utilized to the advantage of children. Uh, so thinking about um, uh, taking further a further um, uh, um, claim to the committee in relation to the violation of rights in the digital environment might be something to be thinking about. And then finally, in all of this, it's really important to monitor and evaluate, to think about as you're going through what strategies are working, what's not working, why is it working, why are things effective, and then review and, and reflect and, and, and use those findings to then strengthen advocacy and go forward with renewed energy and vigor to achieve the goals that we're all seeking to achieve. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much, um, Jerison. Um, yeah, there's definitely a call to action um, in this um, in in this panel today, and um, I think just as we have given a lot of thought to how to kind of um, encourage and um, uh, empower child rights activists and NGOs to get involved in managing the digital world, we um, have similarly given a, a, a fair amount of thought to how to encourage those thinking about. Um, uh, internet governance, and, and that's especially appropriate for this event, to get, get them to think or encourage them to think about questions of child rights. And I do see those as kind of two sets of um, uh, advocates and activists in a way that, you know, there's there's a, there's so much to be gained by bringing them together. And the a lot of the general comment is kind of written facing both ways. You know, we, we need to bring child rights into internet governance. We need to bring questions of di the digital world into debates about child rights, um, not, not to be too, too binary about it. And I thought I might just make a few remarks now about um, the some of the dilemmas of drafting. I'm an academic, so I'm always happy with kind of dilemmas and uh, knotty problems. Uh, and some of my colleagues are, are um, better at thinking up solutions. Um, but I think for those um, who uh, are really focus on questions of internet governance and regulation, um, it, it will be apparent that there were some kind of tensions and dilemmas in, in drafting this kind of I think brilliant 10,000 word um, document and one one is the challenge of future proofing it of, of, of trying to not write a document that will be out of date in um, just a few months time when the latest digital innovation comes in um, and that's why it's been so important to um, those presenting today to really kind of emphasize the principles and to really uh, you know, be clear that whatever the particular um, innovation um, we, 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 we do need to focus on what those those principles are. Um, I think another, and perhaps this is a kind of subtext of a lot of those talking about children's rights at the IGF, has been to kind of write against the um, vision, perhaps myth, that somehow the internet um, is the rightful place of adults and children are, are sort of interlopers and something of a nuisance within that within that space. Um, and really, um, so it is written to say children are here in the world, they are one in three of the world's internet users, they um, absolutely have the same rights as everyone else to, um, to have their rights um, respected and protected in um, a digital world. And that formulation very much kind of recognises the impossibility possibility now of pulling apart um, digital and um, whatever, I'm knocking my table, real world. Um, 
And and that means that we had to give some uh, thought also to the question of, you know, how what are the different ways in which children are engaged with 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 the Internet? It, and, and sometimes people hear us as talking about children just as users. And we are talking about children as users of digital products and services and networks. But we're also talking about children as impacted by um, the digital world in ways that matter. Um, perhaps even if they never use it, even if they don't have access, even if they live in a country too poor to provide um, connectivity and, and access, they may still be um, impacted both by the wealthier world embracing the digital technologies and investing in it, and in the ways in which they their lives are datafied and kind of managed by um, digital processes of um, bureaucracy and commerce even if they themselves never get the, 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 the tool in their in their hands. Um, so, you know, there and, and then perhaps one one more dilemma very much um, on the agenda, I think, in relation to the question of evolving capacities that um, uh, uh, Philip spoke about. We, we absolutely know that um, in the in the in the history of the world, um, society has treated children according to their evolving capacities. We've always treated babies differently from children and toddlers differently from teenagers and so forth. But the digital world struggles with that because it professes not to know who is a child. And I think we have the digital comment, the, the general comment has come out at this very interesting moment when it is kind of clear that digital providers know an awful lot about everyone who is using and impacted by their services um, and it is kind of now time to uh, use that knowledge to treat children according to their ev um, evolving capacities but no doubt that that is contentious there are a lot of debates on at the moment about age verification and age assurance i think it has finally become apparent to those engaged in internet governance that to treat children as children also means to know who is a child and who is an adult much more generally. And there's no question this is raising some thorny issues of implementation around questions of, of privacy. So we do, again, kind of have that sense of child versus adult rights and freedoms. And I would just reiterate that the general comment is written very carefully not to create that kind of polarization, to find solutions, to find ways of, of kind of thinking and taking, um, taking uh, internet governance forward in a way that can be child rights respecting. And I think in that regard, we um, are also um, uh, speaking with those who want the internet to be human rights respecting and to respect the rights of those with um, special needs and disabilities or those who are displaced persons and refugees or you know there's a lot of call on many different sides now for embedding ethics and values and human rights into questions of internet governance so the general comment kind of puts um, the rights of children I think in that larger um, uh, enterprise, as well as asserting, as 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 Philip very powerfully said, that children are, um, you know, today's children are all they'll be of 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 the human race in um, twenty years' time. So let's get it right um, for them, or 30, 40 years, perhaps. I don't want to be too. Um, there are other dilemmas um, that we had in the writing. Um, there are some kind of interesting kind of nitty gritty ones about respecting children's rights. Children want internet access to be a right, for example. And there was an interesting debate about kind of recognizing that internet access um, is the mechanism, is the means by which children now access their rights. And in that sense, it is vital. Um, there is a, a, a bigger debate than um, uh, I can um, weigh in on at the level of the UN about wh when, when and whether internet access itself becomes a right. I think that, that will be a, a really critical question for the, the IGF. Um, I think, however, that we have all talked long enough and I'm going to pass the floor now uh, to those who have very patiently um, listened. Um, and I can see that there, I'm, I, I'm told that there are more people listening on the live stream to this um, event. And sadly, I don't think there's a mechanism for them to put up their hand, but um, anyone is welcome to um, turn on their camera or um, uh, say anything they would like. Um, and in the interim, I think 
Philip wants to ask a question, so he may. Thank you, and, and thanks for all your presentations. I just wanted to respond to what Jarrison brought up with a very current piece of information, the link you made between um, uh, climate activists and the uh, digital world. Right this very second, <laughs> in Dublin, there's a uh, exchange uh, uh, workshop um, uh, on uh, child human rights defenders in the digital world and how they can teach civil society to better understand how to support them in the digital world. And I don't know if you're following my drift, but it's the world upside down in a way, which is really exciting. Um, so yes, climate activists, child human rights defenders, the digital world, I think they're inextric inextricably uh, linked. Thank you, yes. Actually, that reminds me, while I wait for someone to put up their hand, uh, that one of the other kind of tensions through the drafting process and all the discussions held around the, the general comment, as I think somebody already commented, is that kind of um, the importance of recognising children themselves as um, civic and political actors, as um, on occasion human rights defenders. It's not a world of child protection versus kind of adult freedoms of expression. It is absolutely a world in which children's um, freedoms of expressions and civic and political actions um, must have um, space to, um, must have the um, opportunity to express themselves online as well as in other, in other fora. Uh, we have um, we have about 10 minutes left of this session. Um, again, if I can, um, everyone's very, folk are very welcome to put on their cameras or um, weigh in on how the issues that we've been addressing might seem in different parts of the world or those that you've been um, uh, attending. I'm hoping that there are kind of echoes of this conversation in other parts of the um, uh internet governance forum i know that b van kidron had to go literally to another session that was kind of clashing with this one uh on uh, how to um take the general comment forward into um legislation um but other thoughts maybe i can ask philip or jaris and philip perhaps to um say something about concluding observations about the way in which the general comment will be part of the um committee on the rights of the child's review of states progress so. yeah sure uh, very briefly um just so people understand one of the um, ways the committee works is that we receive reports from state every state party states party um, which uh, and each one um, sort of summarized the, summarizes the progress that is made in the field of children's rights. And then once we receive the reports and uh, we assess uh, with the help of uh, civil society what is going on in a particular country, we have what is called a so-called uh, constructive dialogue with uh, this state party and um, where we exchange uh, our views and we can make recommendations, which find their way into uh, concluding observations, which is our, the committee's view of the roadmap that the country must uh, accomplish until its next report. So the um, challenge with every general comment is how to maximize um, the um, recommendations uh, in the field that the general comment covers uh, and tailor it to the specific um needs and the capacities of the, a given country uh, obviously um, the recommendations on uh, on um, digital rights are not the same for switzerland which we reviewed recently and i mentioned that because i'm speaking to you from switzerland then from other countries that don't come that are not as obscenely rich as uh, as a uh, as a first world uh, country so-called first world country um so yeah, we, we try very hard to tailor some recommendations to every country in this, um, in this uh, field. It's a bit of a challenge um, with, um, because, uh, the, and, and this, I'll just end with this. 
there are so many children's rights <laughs> and there's so many priorities to focus on and our concluding observations also have to be um, uh, uh, written in a way that the uh, state's party does not feel overwhelmed uh, by um, fantastic achievements that it must carry out. So again, uh, but the, the, the effect of recency of the general comment really helps in terms of, uh, of, um, of uh, including them in general, in, in the concluding observations, and obviously along with anything that has to do with uh, the climate crisis. Back to you, Sonia. Can I make a, add a point to that? Mm. Um, Obviously, the um, the concluding observations are are addressed specifically to the to the government to the state party. Um, but what happens when when this examination takes place um, in Geneva in the, in the dialogue between the committee members and the government on what they've been doing to implement the CRC? Prior to that, in very many countries around the world, there will be um, a coalition of NGOs who will have submitted what's called an alternative report to the committee. So the government do their report and then the NGOs, human rights commissions and others will submit a separate report, which is often much, much more critical about what's actually been going on. So they come together to do that report. So they may well be uh, raising issues about failure to comply with issues around children's rights and digital environment. Once the concluding observations have been produced, there's a next stage for the NGOs work to begin. So, so although they're addressed to the government, it's really important that the NGOs working on children's rights in that country grab hold of that document and look at it in detail and look at how can we advocate effectively to get these, recommend these specific recommendations targeted at our government, how can we get them implemented? Um, so, so here too, there is a very critical role for NGOs to, to be the voice, um, to, to raise awareness and not allow this document to just get filed away in a shelf and no further action taken, that they have to keep it alive um, and generate the energy to make it happen. Um. Thank you. The call to action is loud and clear. Um, well, I think um, if, and as anyone wants to ask a question, I might now um, give everyone the chance for a quick cup of tea before the next um, session. We just have a couple of minutes, um, but um, uh, Daryl Williams has been um, taking assiduous notes, I know, and is going to write a report um, on everything that was said, and that will go into the IGF record. And uh, I say that with great pleasure because I've been coming to the IGF um, for so long that I can recall um, when people said children, no, they have no place here, rights, children's rights, what are those? Um, I think actually this, this um, organisation has been transformed over the last um, uh, 10 years to really kind of give space for discussions on, on children's rights in relation to the digital environment. So um, uh, thank you, Daryl. Um, thank you uh, to Biban in her um, absence. And thank you very much, Philip and Jerison and to those who have um, attended and watching on the live stream. Thank you very much, everybody, and we'll close here.